Hey folks, uh, let's have another round of applause for our next speaker. Okay. Uh, so hello and thank you all for coming today. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here and I'm super thrilled uh, to have this opportunity all to have this opportunity to speak to you all today about two of my most favorite programming languages, Python and Rust. You know, both of them really make me feel uh, like a, as a, like a complete developer. I'm here to you know basically share those experiences uh, with you. Uh, so today I'm going to talk about you know how as uh, we as Python developers can you know maybe write a small Python extensions or look f uh, take some part of our workload and convert it to a statically typed language in order to get that performance boost. So my talk is mostly going to be around that. Uh, so if you are like me and we're attending all the kind of uh, you know uh, performance related talk here in PyCon, you probably must have noted down these golden rules. So the first one is like you know uh, look for a like like use some tools like a line profiler then look at which part of your program is actually slow. And then the second thing would be to you know, go ahead Google and see how people have solved this problem in the Python community, because Python community is amazing. There is someone who has definitely solved that problem. Maybe use that libraries that they have built or use the techniques that they have used uh, to you know, think about solving this problem that you are also facing. The third thing is don't use Python, like use something else uh, that has you know, worked uh, before. So, so I thought, like you know, uh, let's let's start from the third point. You know, let's start uh, from something that is not Python. So I'm really happy that my talk is scheduled at this point of time, uh, because after hearing all the performance-related talks, so we're gonna uh, focus more on the third point of using something that's not Python, but in order to in order to use some languages like Rust, which is a system programming language, to basically you know uh, improve uh, your Python modules. Uh, so we'll talk a lot about Rust in this talk, uh, and you know, see how we can leverage its features in Python. Uh, so before, get start, uh, before getting started, let me just uh, quickly introduce myself. My name is Vigneshwar. Uh, I'm here today representing Mozilla as a tech speaker. A lot of uh, people, you know, looking at my badge, asked, uh, "What's a Mozilla tech speaker?" So I think I should talk a little about that. It's an amazing program uh, run by the developer outreach team of Mozilla, where they take, you know, really. Uh, enthusiastic volunteers and train them to be like developer advocates to go out in developer advocacy conferences like these to talk about uh, Mozilla and web in general. Oh, I'm sorry, sorry about this. Okay, I'm just keep, gonna keep moving my mouse to make sure that things are up. Uh, apart from that, I'm a data scientist by the day. I, I work, I build a lot of state of art uh, machine learning algorithms. I enjoy doing that. Uh, that's where I use Python a lot. Uh, you know, Python is the best for data science. And uh, uh, yeah, apart from that, I've written a book in Rust, so it, it really helps people to get started with Rust programming. It's called the Rust Book. That's pretty much about myself, so let's get started. Uh, so why do we need a native extension? Like, that's the first question that comes to our mind, right? So it's basically because you have some really good library that is statically typed, and then you want to bring that to Python, like computer visions. Uh, a lot of, you see a lot of image processing uh, libraries that have been used, NumPy, for example, and things of that sort. So. We want to use that great engineering work in our Python modules. You don't want to rewrite the entire thing. So, so that's where we start thinking about you know, uh, native extensions. The second thing is when we need a uh, you know, uh, like little more freedom in memory management. That's something that we don't get access to in Python. And the third one is like maybe tinkering around with the hardware and things of that sort. So the point is that you know, performance control has always been this key. Like for building state, like applications right now, uh, which, which are so demanding, like you need to have all these amazing features you need to be competent, and uh, th that's what will get you that edge in your, uh, in your particular business or in your particular domain. So products these days are very demanding. So with Python, I think, with just Python, it's going to be a little bit tricky. Uh, so we need to start looking for some alternatives. So that's one big motivation behind this talk. So what has been the solution still now? Python community. Like, they have probably solved this problem for you. Just go out and look out for what they have done. Uh, when's the last time that you know uh, you probably have faced a problem and then the Python community was not there to help you? Most of the time, it really works. So this is not some this is not new to us. Like you know, Py, uh, as being a Python developer, you have somewhere used these kind of libraries. So NumPy for example, NumPy for example, is 53 percentage of C code. That's what gets uh, that's that's what makes it magical. You know, it make, it, it makes it work so good. Uh, TensorFlow, for example, that's something I do uh, I use on day to day basis. It's like 48 percentage of C plus plus code. Uh, Cython, the one, uh, C Python, the one that you know runs your Python code, that has a lot of uh, you know uh, system programming code in it. Uh, Pillow is an, again an uh, image processing library which is uh, heavily used across various domain. That has a lot again a lot of uh, 
C code in it. So, but what, what's, what's the problem like? You know, C++ developers are like Superman. They're really difficult to find. Like, you know, uh, like, yeah, they're very strong, <laughs> like Superman is. Yes. Uh, but the reality is, like, it's very difficult to write C++ expre uh, extensions. You, ne you need to have that kind of expertise. And uh, given the kind of timelines where, uh, you know, especially I can talk for myself, I come from a service industry and, you know, Timelines are a big problem for me. I can't even think about static code. The reason why I use Python is to make sure that my code runs without any bug. <laughs> you know, uh, so that's where I see uh, uh, you know Python being really useful. That's what makes Python really good. It's readable. Uh, it's super easy and works just fine. But the problem is uh, there are people like Lex Luthor who who you know would be some kind of hacker who'd go down, look at your system code, and try to you know exploit it. Uh, for example, kryptonite is a big problem for uh, Superman, right? So historically, we have seen so many bugs uh, that have, you know, caused us a lot of problems. Data racers, sec falls. So this is something that you need to uh, manually handle. That Python just takes care of all that for us. Like you have a garbage collector. I'll, I'll shortly talk a lot more about that. But uh, the point is, um, if you're writing C++ extension, you need to handle these things which are a bit difficult. That's the reason why I, uh, I'm, I've stated that you know, writing C++ extension is scary and painful. Uh, so what are the other options that we have? Um, a Cython, uh, it's, a, it's a superset of Python. Uh, you know, it's an easy way of calling C functions and the data types over there. Works pretty good. Uh, Numba is another uh, very good option out, available out there which uses the uh, JIT compiler. It's basically optimized machine code which works on the LLVM compiler. Works pretty good. Uh, the last one is PyPy. Use something that's not even Python. You know, Python, but yeah, it's a debatable topic again. Uh, it, 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 yeah, it again uses a JSON and compiler. Works pretty fine. But the problem is, like, for people like me, I, I can't talk for all. I kind of feel that I've lost my control. Like, I use all these tools, and um, it works fine for me. Like, but I'm not sure what's actually exactly happening. Uh, it kind of makes me feel sad. Uh, that's why I started looking for uh, alternatives. And what was the main ask? The main ask is that you know you want uh, C++ kind of performance, portability, and embeddability without uh, with you know guaranteed safety. What I mean by safety is that the one that Python you know kind of gives to us. You don't have to worry a lot about this memory and things of that sort. I just want to focus on my application and again have these kind of performance boost. <coughs> Sorry. Uh, so let me introduce you to uh, an amazing state of art programming language. It's called Rust. Uh, it's a system programming language which I like to define has great control like C++ and delivers productivity like in Python and uh, is super safe. So there are three things that you know uh, the Rust uh, language you know really really does really well. So that's number one. It's hack without fear. Second is abstraction without overhead and stability without stagnation. So hack without the fear is this concept of uh, going to the production without having these kind of bugs. Abstraction without overhead is uh, the zero cost abstraction which the community is really proud about. I'll talk a lot more about that when I come to trades. And stability without stagnation is whenever a new version of Rust comes in, it should not you know, go back and uh, uh, cause you any kind of problems with your current extension. So every version really should be uh, flawless. You know? that's, that, that's something that every uh, software developer wants. And I truly believe that Rust is creating a new generation of system programmers. Uh, you, I have never done system programming before, but I'm really confident with all those terminologies and I just go around uh, you know, uh, uh, boasting about myself to be a system programmer. But yeah, so the goal is that you, know, you need to create a really stable, a confident, and a safe, safe uh, system programming language. So the gen of Rust is you have a memory safety without garbage collection. Uh, again, I'll, I'll, uh, when I come to ownership and borrowing, which is the core concept behind uh, the Rust language, rich stripe system, uh, which allows you to you know, have a lot of good things like you can read the code really well. It's easy to understand. You write, you know, you exactly know what's happening under the hood. High-level iterators, that's something we all love as Python developers. Uh, we are spoiled by it to some extent. That's another topic altogether. But yeah, that Rust has a, lo uh, a lot of offerings over that. Freedom on data races and a welcoming community. This is something that you would really appreciate coming from a Python uh, background. Like, we, we need a really, really strong ecosystem, a so strong library ecosystem. That's something uh, Rust is really focused on. Let's look at some facts and uh, figures. Um, so this is, a, this is this app called Wire. So it's basically an, uh, an application that does business uh, chats and WebRTC conference calls and things of that sort. So what they basically did was they moved their entire cryptocurrency part to Rust and saw like a good performance. That's pretty cool. Uh, this is another company called Sentry, which I think I saw them here. 
So they have done a really good job in you know uh, writing their a, pass, a, a parser which ma uh, you know uh, does passing of their source maps in Rust and have significantly reduced their processing time. Uh, so I think Armin is this person who uh, has written this, and he also happens to be the guy who developed the Flask app. Uh, he's given a lot of cool talks before this, so I really recommend to go check that out. And they have done like significant work here. Uh, so another company called Snips. Uh, they are like uh, voice assistant companies. They are using Rust heavily to you know ship their products, ship their AI models across different hardware. Works really well for them. There's this another. Uh, a proof of concept library that is written over a uh, Tokyo, which is a very fast and reliable way of writing, handling asynchronous requests. And if you can see this graph, the kind of uh, request that you can handle asynchronous is very high, and you know, it would basically so, you know, help you save a lot of money in uh, production environments. Again, this is a proof of concept, but it will be really good if this uh, comes, out to be in, uh, comes out in a stable version. So this is another thing that the Rust community is really proud about. You know, for third time in the row, uh, they have been voted the most loud language. This is something really cool for a language that just got released in 2015, right? So a lot of companies are using them. Uh, they have really, really good use cases. I don't have time to talk about them, but I really recommend you guys to go check out uh, the Friends of Rust website. Um, like again, there's a lot of inspiration that you could take, uh, you know, take from there and kind of try to apply in your workplace. So how did it all begin? So Mozilla is the company that sponsors this project, but it's a community-driven initiative altogether. So browser at its core uh, perf you know, compete for performance, and they need safety as well. So it was really important for uh, Mozilla to you know, invest in this. So they are, that's the Rust project for you, which I think started around uh, uh, 2006, maybe. It was more like a Mozilla employee was working on this, and then something similar. They had like a lot of functional programming influence in it, and it was very similar to C++. And then at one point of time, Rust had garbage collectors. So the language has evolved over time. And uh, it's such a, a nice experience to read about uh, what, what has been happening in the community. And the server project is a way of creating high performance browser engine, uh, which you know the whole, whole of Rust language is influenced by that. Um, uh, in Firefox 48, Rust was introduced. Uh, this is the first time that you know, as a such product of this scale, Rust had, Rust had come in. It was uh, a URL parser. Then Firefox 57, great success story here. They rewrote a lot of their parts in Rust. Uh, the stylo was one among them, which gave them uh, a lot of uh, performance at runtime. I uh, highly recommend to go out and uh, check that out. So let me just uh, you know, introduce you to the Rust syntaxes, because the later part of the slides have a lot of Rust syntax that you need to understand. Rush is really, really easy to learn. So you use the let variables to you know, create a variable binding. You don't have to explicitly mention what type it is. The compiler is smart enough to understand that. All variables by default are immutable, and then you have to explicitly mention mutable type as mute in order to make a, a variable binding as mutable. So in, in, run, in at, uh, runtime, you can change the value when you have mentioned it as mute. Otherwise, it's not possible. Uh, uh, unlike in uh, let variable, you in, if you want to declare a constant, you have to explicitly mention the type. And this particular variable will be same throughout the scope of the program. So functions are pretty similar. So the only one thing that I would uh, you know, uh, recommend to focus on is everything is explicitly mentioned, the type that goes into a particular function. This basically helps in reading your functions really well. Uh, and then you don't have to explicitly mention return types. It's the, the last statement is uh, usually inferenced as the thing that you're trying to return. Uh, flow control, pretty straightforward, nothing fancy here. It just if condition if passes it you know processes some code if else not. Uh, so uh, pattern matching or switch in general is done uh, through the keyword match. So you have a match, a variable, and then you have a lot of conditions around it. If you have a single value, a group of values, a range of values, and the underscore is basically default. Uh, this is an infinite loop, a while loop with the condition. So in in uh, in Rust, you all have iterator types. So you a type need to be uh, a type needs to be like iteratable in order to you know run for loops. Uh, so here you basically have a range, and uh, in an expression is should be an iterable type for it to run in for types. So Rust gives you all the kind of uh, types that you usually find in a system programming language. Uh, nothing uh, different. So you have something called Cargo, which is really really cool. It's very similar to pip, uh, but does things more, I believe. Like there are little, little more functionalities that uh, you know Cargo really does well. Uh, but there are a lot of similarities over there. So coming back from coming from a Python community, Cargo will be something that you will really, really enjoy because I definitely did. 
so coming to the core concept, this is something that you really need to understand. If you are able to understand this, you're probably master trust. So ownership, that's some, it's, an, it's more like a right of possessing something. So let's look at this Python example. So you have a class, it calculates the area, and then you're creating three such uh, objects, uh, and you know, calculating the area, and you're uh, you know, having an accumulator that uh, adds up the area over there. So basically in the heap memory, you would probably have uh, three circles. And what basically happens over time is there will be a garbage collector software which runs behind uh, under the hood that would go and clear up this. So it uses reference counting and things of that sort in Python. So we as Python developers don't really you know, care about it because this is something that is taken care of by the Python interpreter. Uh, pretty cool, right? So in, uh, similar to referencing, you, you can just you know, get, get some values out and pass it to different classes, like considering a booking service. Uh, sorry, there's a small typo over there. Booking service and repair, uh, uh, repair service are holding a reference to this, va uh, this variable, and this would totally work fine. But let's try to do this in Rust. Uh, this would, call, this would you know, fail at compile time. It basically will throw you an error saying that you know, this particular type has been moved. Like, how are you supposed to even program this way? Like, I can't even pass a reference. So this is where ownership really, really comes into place. So everything in Rust uh, is owned by a scope. So a scope, particular, a scope basically owns a particular uh, a variable or a particular resource, and the moment the, the variable, the scope goes, the variable goes out of scope, it is deterministic, de deterministically destructed. So that's the reason why you don't need a garbage collector. So the memory is freed as soon as the own variable goes out of scope. That's the most important thing that you need to uh, you know, remember. So that's the reason why when we pass the vehicle uh, variable to the booking service, and so the booking service is not explicitly returning back the ownership to the main thread. So when we call the repair, uh, repair service, uh, this, uh, the vehicle will not exist because it has been deterministically destructed. So how am I supposed to code like this? Like how can I pass variables between threads? So that's where borrowing comes into place. So you could use an ambersign symbol to pass a reference. Uh, pretty simple, so lending is the key here. Uh, so you, can, you, can, you are basically passing the ownership between threads or between functions. And then there are two types of borrowing. One is immutable type and a mutable type. Immutable type does not allow you to make a change in the particular, that particular uh, memory location. And a mutable type allows you to do that. You could have like any number of uh, you know, immutable references, but you just can't have, at a given point of time, one mutable reference. Makes sense, right? So yeah, so this is how you know, uh, Rust kind of handles a memory uh, management without any garbage collector. So let's look at some high-level iterators which I have told about. So here we're finding a particular word in a uh, string. And then you have things like you know, into iter, which converts uh, your particular strings into iteratable types. And you have a map function, which calls the WC line function, in which you have filters and folds. So these are the high-level iterators that I was talking about. Really, really makes it, you have to write really fast. But how do I like, do it in a parallel way, like make things move faster? Uh, there's, there's this package called uh, Rayon. And all that you have to change is you know, make uh, into iter into into paraiter. Pretty simple, right? So it uh, gives you a lot of a uh, boost at uh, runtime. So Ryan is a very, very super cool package. I highly recommend to check it out. It really helps in data parallelism and uh, data parallelism. So there are some custom data types that you could build. Struct is a way to do that. They are like lightweight references. They have fields. Uh, they also have uh, methods. So, but you cannot have them partially filled. It will throw you an error at runtime. So, uh, what you could basically do is use something like an option, which is an enum, that's usually uh, used for error handling in Rust. And match and enum are a very, very good way of doing error handling in Rust. Uh, structs can have methods, so use the implement keyword to you know, build methods for uh, structs. So the another important topic that I want to talk about is trait, which are like interfaces in Rust that allows you to add functionalities, like you know, have the similar kind of functionality, same function names for different types. So this is where the dynamic dispatch happens at runtime. And there's something called generics, uh, which is, again, a very cool topic. I think I'm running out of time. I'm going, I'm going to skip this part. So let's look at uh, developing and shipping Rust extensions in Python modules. That's the reason why you guys are here, right? So the way to do it is using foreign function interfaces. Foreign function phases are the way to, you know, you, you probably want to share your particular data types from one language to the other languages. That's, that's where, you know, uh, a foreign function interface comes into place. Uh, it's based on platform-dependent uh, C, bind C application binary interfaces that you have, and Rust is known to you know produce really really efficient C bindings. That's one reason why I feel uh, Rust is a you know a good option that you might consider for writing your Python extensions. Uh, again, coming to the point that you know the control aspects, you really know uh, what's happening. You 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 looked at the Rust code; it was pretty easy to understand. It was not 
that difficult, right? It had a lot of similarities to Python and other languages out there. So it basically gives you this opportunity to understand what you're writing. You just don't have to blindly believe on some tools. Uh, that's something that, you know, as programmers, we need to really, really focus on. Uh, so yeah, if, if Python is Tony Stark and then Iron Man would be Rust and the comp Rust compiler would be Javis, so that, that's that's my uh, you know e example. So it's really really ideal for uh, ideal for creating and using FFI modules. Uh, so you start off by uh, you know mentioning uh, the library that you want to create. So you have to in Rust you have to first create a binary. So you use a dynamic. So if you look at the create types, creates are similar to libraries in Rust, uh, similar to uh, libraries in Python. And using a create type, you create a dynamic library that would, uh, you know, have an output like the dot .so files in Linux and a dot uh, .dl file in Windows and things of that sort. And uh, next up is where you create an extension. So Rust standard library gives you some uh, uh, some uh, inbuilt data types for interacting with these uh, tree strings and tree inputs. No mangle is a way to you know an attribute that you mention in order to tell that don't change my function names at, uh, while compiling. And yeah, you, you don't have to explicitly go through the code. Uh, the point is that it's very easy to write these uh, extensions. And uh, you can compile it to your Python code using uh, uh, the CFFI modules. I highly recommend to go out the, check out the documentation. It has like, quite, uh, quite a lot of things that needs to be covered. And you could always build it with your uh, setup.py. So there are other tools that I highly recommend to go out check out, like setuptools.rust, milksnake. Uh, milksnake, again, written by uh, the Sentry guys. So it works really well. Uh, but there are other alternatives. As people say, don't reinvent the wheels. Uh, you have a lot of types to uh, you know, manually handle. There are uh, vectors and arrays that you want to basically pass out. So Rush C Python is a good uh, library out there. It's a it's library or crate, which probably handles uh, uh, the other, other C bindings that you want to have. Uh, it's an easy way to you know, communicate between Rust and Python. So here I basically have a Python code, which you know, I'm trying to do some string processing. Com uh, uh, find the doubles in a uh, particular line of string. I'm using two ways. You can just use a zip, and then I'm using a regex to uh, do that. Uh, and I'm creating like a, a, a billion uh, characters. So you use the uh, Rust uh, benchmark, uh, PyTest benchmark uh, library to you know benchmark your uh, performance at runtime. And uh, now let's now create an extension in uh, Rust to do the same. So. We first, of, first of all, we start off uh, mentioning the, uh, the crate that we're going to use, that is CPython. Uh, call those uh, string, uh, types that you're going to probably use in our Rust code. And then here I have a similar implementation of uh, the same uh, counting functionality in Rust. And, but if you can notice, clearly I have used uh, PyResult as my type, because that's what's going to like handle exceptions in Python and you know, communicate between uh, the statically compiled uh, SO file and your uh, Python interpreter. And it also, the first argument to that is in Python type, which you know, goes down and you know, you, uh, locks your uh, global uh, G, uh, GIL, uh, GL. And uh, yeah, then OK is a way to return back uh, the success of this particular program, the final value. At last, you have to use a macro in order to explicitly mention the functions that you're going to export. Uh, so it's, again, a nice interface to uh, you know, compile out uh, the functions that you're going to use. So yeah, you would find a significant uh, boost in performance. So the pure Python, uh, you know, it, it, it's just like 25 times faster and 10 times, uh, almost 10 times faster than uh, the regex version. So that's the advantage of you know, compiling ahead of time uh, and using static programming languages. So there are other things that you probably want to do with you know, allocation of memory. There's a lot more. You know, this, is, this is a very simple example, but at uh, building production applications, you probably want to do a lot more things like pass vectors and things of that sort. Uh, so you, I would highly recommend this talk by my friend Nikita, who also happens to be a tech speaker. This is a good talk to go out and check. He has talked in detail about F5 and Rust. So there are, again, good tooling system that is available in Rust. You have Rust Hub, which is the Rust, to, uh, Rust uh, toolchain installer. Helps you to go between different versions of Rust, Rust format, Rust clip There are some uh, good ways to maintain like, really, really good code bases. Cargo, which I mentioned before, is package manager. And there are a lot of other tooling systems out there. Uh, Rust is a community-driven uh, project. Uh, you know, everything happens through an RFC. You will have to, uh, if you want some kind of changes, you, you, you submit an RFC proposal, the community verifies it. There's something called crates.io where you know, all these packages get uh, you know, uploaded. 
you'll find a, a pretty, it's, it's a very good library ecosystem. Like given the time, there's been a lot of grades that have been published over there and pretty helpful. Uh, to summarize, uh, you know, I, I, when, do we, when do we have to use Rust? Like, you know, like the main thing that I would say if there's some kind of mathematical uh, complex, complex code that you, ha that you have in your existing stack, that's something that you can convert to Rust and, you know, get, get the advantage of strategy type languages. For accessing hardware, you know, kernel level APIs, Rust gives you like good uh, types and uh, you know interfaces to do that. Uh, implementing advanced uh, concurrency paradigms, really really easy. But keep just uh, keep in mind that you know calling between languages, it's a bit costly. So do that in a very responsible way. Make, don't should not be like your for every you know API request or things of that sort. You are uh, calling an uh, a, a, a Rust build function or Rust statically typed uh, Rust functions. So what does Rust has to offer? It's a modern replacement to C++. And if you're someone like me who is looking for learning a system programming language and then feels C++ is a bit difficult to learn, Rust is definitely a good choice. And apart from that, it's about you know, improving your tool chain. You, you, want, to, you want to like uh, learn on a day-to-day -day basis because there's some concepts that we don't really, really care about in Python, but uh, given computer science advancing so fast, we need, those langu we need to know about those concepts and Rust is a very good way to learn them. I personally learned it that way. It's just a rich runtime and then has a lot of strong uh, pro, uh, functional programming influence, which is really good and just something that we as Python developers really love. Uh, so yeah, feel awesome, like, you know, uh, and uh, yeah, that's pretty much about uh, all that I wanted to cover. Uh, and thank you so much, like, you can, uh, my, I'm an Adre D. Vignesh on Twitter, and then I've just put together some good talks in PyCon US, tinyurl.pycon US, so do feel, to, feel free to go check them out. I think we have a couple of more minutes left for questions. Thank you so much. So uh, if anyone has any questions, please feel free to step up to the question mics. There's one over here and one over there. Um, yeah, we've uh, got a couple more minutes, so please, uh, please ask anything that's on your mind. Or I'll be around here, so feel free to, you know, uh, yeah. Uh, I was curious, do you know if Rust has much uh, libraries for scientific computing, like crunching numbers like people do with NumPy and stuff? Uh, at, at this moment, not many. I'll be very honest with you. Uh, but uh, that's something that I like to do in my free time. I'm, I'm building like, you know, some deep learning packages, uh, like just one deep learning package. Yeah. But it's a fun thing to do, you know. You, you, you learn a lot in that process. Yeah. There are very few, actually, very, very specific to industries. But there's a lot of amazing crates in networking, embedded systems, and those areas. But yeah, with scientific computing, we are not there yet. Uh, but it's a very, very interesting domain for Rust. Yes, thanks. Hi, thanks for the talk. Um, so if I take a NumPy array and I pass it to Rust, or if Rust has uh, some array and it wants to pass it back to Python, um, what does it show up as? Like, do you have to specify all of the, uh, like the, the shapes manually, yeah. or will it infer? So, uh, so that's where things like you know, Rust C Python comes into picture. Uh, they handle it for you. But if you want to do that from scratch, you can use the Rust uh, inbuilt FFI modules to do that. OK, thank you. Yeah. Hey, so currently, if I want to speed up something with Python as far as computation is concerned, I'm probably going to use either Cython or C++ or something along those lines. Uh, what kind of situations have you seen where Rust will outperform uh, Cython or C++? I have, I've not actually benchmarked between Cython and Rust. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes I think you get like really, really close performance. It really depends on what you're building and what your application is. Uh, but uh, like, you know, it's all about control. And you, I, I showed some use cases, right? Like yeah. uh, in web development, parsing, and things of that sort. They have, they have, they have historically been a you know, good performance boost over there. OK, thank you. Hey, thanks for the talk. Um, do you know of any Python C libraries that have switched to Rust and what their experience like that has been? Yeah, so uh, the Sentry guys have uh, done that. Uh, not really sure with the library names, but there are a couple of them out there. I can, I can sh share that to you later. Yeah. Thanks for the introduction to Rust. Um, in your summary slide, uh, one line you said, Rust is no runtime needed.
Can you kind of explain that a little bit? I'm sorry, I didn't follow the question. Um, one of your lines says rust is not wrong time needed. Uh, I'm really, really sorry. I'm not able to follow. Are you able to get the question? Oh, okay, okay, yeah, yeah. So you're basically compiling ahead of time. So you have your entire abstract syntax tree built. So that's something uh, Python does on the fly, right? It's uh, it's a scripting language, and the other one is a system programming language. That's where you get that uh, kind of compu uh, computation boost. Uh, so that, that's that's what I meant by no runtime needed. Thank you. Hope that helps. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much, guys.